In our center, we define emotional intelligence as five key skills. The first is recognizing emotion in the face, body, voice. The second is the understanding of emotion. And that really gets into the causes and the consequences of emotion, but also how emotions drive our thinking, our decisions, and our behavior. So how emotions in different states cause us to think differently or make different decisions. Labeling emotions, uh, having the right word to know the difference between being disappointed, upset, frustrated, jealousy, envy, expressing emotion, and finally, um, the one that everybody cares about the most is the regulation of emotion. Our attitudes about emotional intelligence are critically important because they drive much of what we'll do to help our children raise their own emotional intelligence. So that's the first step is just saying, well, emotions matter, and they matter a great deal in my relationship with my child, and I'm going to be very proactive in terms of teaching my kid about emotions. The second is you have to know what emotional intelligence is. So those are the skills of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotion. And then you've got to be deliberate about what you teach. So you're watching television, you're reading books, you're pointing out the facial expressions, you're asking questions about the read aloud you're doing with your kid, you know, the readings you're doing. You help them articulate more clearly their feelings. You give them the words, say, no, it looks like, you know, you wanted to go to the party this weekend. We couldn't make it. Anger may be the emotion, but it's probably disappointment. Because disappointment, you're feeling disappointed because you didn't get what you expected you were going to get. Adolescent brain development is just in a, it's in a crazy place. So, you know, adolescents have, you know, one system firing up, the other one is going like sort of a roller coaster ride. And so one is just to be mindful of that and accepting that, you know, hormones are being released, neurotransmitters are just trying to get their, figure their way around and be patient because volatility is just part of that. The other piece of it is setting up the systems for kids. You know, for example, you know, leaving your 14 home alone with five other friends, a recipe is a recipe for disaster. So knowing that you know, the peer pressure in adolescence can cause the social and emotional system to go crazy is really important. From my perspective, what happens a lot is that parents and teachers just want the behavior to stop, but they don't want to teach the skills. So it's very easy to say, you know, apologize. But that's not really teaching anything. What you want to do is give children the opportunity to reason with their emotions. That's why we have emotional intelligence. How did that make you feel? How did that make the other person feel? What caused those feelings in you and the other person? How could you have done something different so that that reaction didn't occur? What could that person also have done differently so that the whole thing didn't escalate? What we believe makes an emotionally intelligent classroom different is the engagement, the interactions, the, the experience and expression of emotion. So you'd see a teacher who was teaching a lesson, for example, maybe on a current event about what's happened in you know, uh, Rwanda or something of that nature, and really having students like, be involved in what it felt like or what it would feel like to be in that situation. And then you'd see another teacher doing a read aloud, pointing out the facial expressions and the characters and asking kids to think critically about the emotions and the dynamics and the characters in the book, while at the same time, asking for evidence from the text. So it's very academic, but as well, emotional intelligent. You'd see teachers displaying more positive nonverbal behavior, being more mindful of the facial expressions they're showing to their students. You'd have teachers being very transparent about their own challenging emotions in the classroom and saying, I'm having a really hard day today. I need your help, boys and girls. You know, I need some strategies. You know, you want to work with me on this? I'm noticing that People are not really engaged right now. We need to talk about it and work through it. You'd have students who would raise their hands who were confused and be comfortable saying, hey, I'm confused. I don't understand this. I need help. You'd have teachers who would be walking around the classroom noticing a student who was disengaged and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know what's going on here? You know, I'm worried about you. You, know, what, you don't seem to be your normal self today. So what I think you would see is teachers who are more sensitive to students' needs, teachers who display more positive emotions in the classroom as well as students, um, more empathy, more perspective taking, a little bit less talking on the teacher's part and a lot more listening, um, students working in groups together um, where they're doing problem solving sets and, and engage in the process.
One thing we've learned about emotion regulation is that not every strategy works for everyone. You know, introverts, for example, will want strategies that are different than extroverts. You know, if you're a very sad extrovert, you may want to call people right away because you just like the energy of the social world. If you're an introvert, perhaps you would like to be alone and just read a book or maybe make a phone call to one person to chat through the problem. So what's important to us, and especially the work we do in schools, is helping kids think through the wide range of strategies that are available to them. It could be taking a walk, it could be doing uh, exercise, it could be doing yoga, it could be doing a sport, it could be positive self-talk, it could be reappraisal. And what's interesting about all these different strategies that have been shown to be effective is that they're different for different emotions. The major pushback we get from school systems about integrating emotional intelligence is time. And then I always reframe that by asking principals and teachers, well, how much time do you spend getting your kids ready for learning in the morning? How many challenges do you have with suspensions? How many challenges do you have with kids uh, maybe bullying in your school or uh, lack of student engagement? And as soon as they say, well, we have all those things, I say, well, what if that were different? What if you were bringing in a set of skills that would help teachers become more engaged in the learning process, help students be more self-regulated, and all of a sudden the eyes open wide. For me, what's probably the most important thing about the work that we do is for the adults who are involved in the education of students to realize they're their role models, to recognize that children are watching you everywhere you go, and they're looking for your reactions to things, positive and negative and that we just need to be more skilled at monitoring the emotions we have and being intentional about the emotions that we create in our classrooms because our goal is for students to feel safe, to feel valued, to feel welcome, and to be engaged learners. And what we now know is that bringing in emotional intelligence makes a difference. You know, I always say that, you know, one eye roll can just change a relationship forever. You know, it's. So if you don't really pay attention to the emotions that you're displaying and you just do a little eye roll like that, you know, children are not going to trust you. You know, they've realized that, that that bond has been broken. And it really is hard to, to mend that bond. Because emotional intelligence is such a new construct, there's a lot of stuff that we need to learn about it. I think probably the most important next steps in our research is how to measure it well and measure it well in developmental ways. So thinking about preschoolers and what are the milestones in terms of emotional intelligence there? What about elementary, middle, high school, adults, and creating those norms around these skills of emotional intelligence and then tracking kids longitudinally to see how does emotional intelligence develop and how does the development of emotional intelligence correlate with the development of social skills and academic skills and mental health outcomes? And over the next decade, our center really is going to be focused on developing those assessments, studying kids longitudinally, and tracking related outcomes.